Hello and welcome to another edition of Middleware Friday for Friday, September 21st, 2018. This is episode 73 and we're going to talk about Microsoft Flow Governance Part 2. So what I want to talk today about is a blog post that I recently published. And the purpose of this blog post was really to talk about a concept called defense in depth. So this is a common practice when organizations try to apply a cybersecurity approach with the understanding that there's never a silver bullet when it comes to protecting the enterprise, protecting your digital assets. And certainly from a flow perspective, this is no different. Uh, there, unfortunately, there's no silver bullet when it comes to flow security, much like there's no silver bullet for any type of security strategy. So what we want to talk about is a defense in depth strategy, which means you have multiple layers of defense in the event that one is compromised. You have others that can try to prevent further damage. So it's no different than physical security. Like if you try to go out to, let's say, a power plant. Um, a power plant obviously is a facility that requires a lot of protection in order for someone or in order to prevent someone from causing some significant damage. So you don't just have one set of doors that protecting access to a power plant. You're going to have multiple levels of security. You might have a guard at a gate. You're going to have a fence that has, you know, barbed wire on top of it. Maybe it's electrified. Then inside of the, um, the gate or the fence, then you're going to have, you know, different key card access where to get into the front door, you're going to need to swipe your badge. And then likely, you know, once you're in the facility, there's probably a couple more doors where you're going to have to badge in and badge out as well in order to get into, say, an area where you could truly cause some damage. And that sort of approach is common with cybersecurity for the same reason. If you get past one defense, there's multiple defenses that are available in order to provide additional protection. So when we talk about flow, it's no different. Um, there's multiple different avenues that we can take in order to provide security and governance. And this post really walks you through some examples. So the first one let's talk about is secure data at rest. So number one, a flow user doesn't have access to do anything that they don't already have access to. So what this means is, for example, if I'm on a company network and I can go ahead and log in to a system, it could be, say, a CRM system, um, it could be a social media site. If I have access to log in with my credentials, in a web browser, then I will have access in general to do the same thing through Flow. So if you want to protect your data, your corporate data, the first thing you need to do is you need to secure the data at rest. If you have sensitive information inside of SharePoint, you need to lock that down so that if I shouldn't be accessing that browser, that data in a, in a web browser, I probably shouldn't be accessing that same data through Flow. Next up, let's talk about network access control. Now this one does come with a bit of a caveat, but I think it's often overlooked. And that is when organizations have some level of firewalls or content, application content appliances, the same rules get applied when you're accessing this these assets over the network. So for example, I've seen many organizations that block access to Twitter or Facebook or even your consumer email services. When I log into Flow on the network itself, if you have blocked Gmail, if you have blocked Hotmail, then guess what? When you're in Flow and you try to add a connection to say Hotmail or Gmail or some other service, that same network protection is going to exist. If you prevent logging in through your web browser, then you'll prevent logging in through Flow when you're on the corporate network. So a, a question I like to ask organizations is, when they have concerns about, say, social media, is what do you do normally in order to prevent that access? So back to the previous point around secure data at rest, it's the same thing. If, if you're really concerned about cybersecurity and you're not blocking it to begin with, then I'm not sure um, how important it is to block it through a workflow tool as well. It, it feels like it should be one of the same. If you're blocking it for one scenario, you probably want to block it for others as well. Now, back to the network access control. So a question might come up saying, well, okay, great. You might be able to block you know, it at the firewall when my users are on my company network, but what happens when they're not? Once again, if this is 
that much of a concern for you, you would have the ability to use location-based conditional access. This is something that we haven't talked a ton about, but it is supported for both Power Apps and Flow. I have a link to a presentation here uh, where James Olenek and myself talk about this feature, and you certainly have the ability to use this feature in order to restrict access from where you want your users to access, say, the FlowMaker portal. So if you said, I only want my users to you know, use this when they're on the corporate network, you could enforce that. And at that point, your network access control protection would also be in play. Um, so something that you want to consider. Now, next up, we can talk about data leakage. And this is addressed through our data loss prevention policies. Our DLP policies allow an administrator to group connectors together into business data and non-business data groups. So what this means is that you could put well, our common pattern we see is organizations will typically put all of their Office 365 services and the Microsoft first party connectors inside of business data. And then what they'll typically do is they'll put, say, some of the social media or consumer grade services in the non-business data group. And what this allows you to do is it allows you to ensure that when you're building flows or power apps, they can only include connectors from the same data group. So in general, when you want SharePoint to be able to talk to, say, Dynamics 365, you put both of those in the data group, the business data group, and then you can ensure that data that is going from, say, Dynamics to Twitter is impossible when Twitter would be in the non-business data group. So that's one way that you can address it. Another way you can address this too, uh, a common pattern or that we do see is you can have policies like that where you have this clear separation between business services and non-business services. Naturally, some business units may need some of these social media type connectors, perhaps it's corporate communications or marketing. What you can also do is you can create an environment where you would restrict access to that environment and then what you would do is you would create different DLP policies that meet their needs. So this is another strategy that you can employ that keeps your base employee safe in the default environment. And then you can address more specific needs by actually creating additional environments and adding only the people that you would like into that specific environment. Uh, next up, let's talk about anomaly detection. Uh, so this is another common strategy used by organizations where we have provided now these management connectors. We've always had one for flow, but we now have additional connectors for the power platform. So that would be your get environments, get DLP policies, and then you would also have power apps. Uh, so these connectors come in a couple flavors, one set for makers and one set for admins. And we've also published a template. So I'll go ahead and click on this template. And in this template, this is going to provide you with a list of new Power Apps flows and connectors. So this is a great tool for an, an administrator to understand what are the different services or flows, Power Apps that are actually being created in your environment. And this will allow you to look at different trends. If there's a lot of activity um, for a specific user, um, that may be a clue that you want to actually dig in and try to understand what they're trying to achieve. Perhaps it's malicious. Perhaps they're actually just trying to benefit the business by automating a bunch of processes. But at least you'll have some additional insight into it. Now, another thing that is, is very important, and this applies to Flow, this is still pending for Power Apps, but leveraging audit trails. So audit trails, especially in this case for Flow, we can track created flow, edited flow, deleted flow. Now, one common concern we hear from different groups is, well, what if happens if a user shares a flow with another user and that user does something they shouldn't be doing with that flow? They, they do something uh, mischievous with that flow. Now, that will be captured in this event. In the edited flow event, you will be able to see what are the connectors that have been included in this version of the flow and this will give you some insight in terms of what they may have changed so another thing that does happen when you do share and you and someone else edits the flow the other people in the group get an email notification of who made those changes as well so while it may be concerning for some i think it it is greatly reduced uh, the risk is that is by actually capturing these different events by giving you an indication of who made the change 
and what are the connectors that are in the flow now. But something you can do is you can actually take advantage of subscribing to webhooks that exist in the Office 365 Security and Compliance Center in order to automate um, understanding, number one, that these events are happening, but also being able to um, provide some proactive governance. And so what we have here is a, another blog post that I recently wrote. And this talks about how you can set all of this up. And the scenario I walk through is we've got a user that has decided to try to forward their email outside of the organization. And what we'll do is we'll subscribe to these different webhook events. Then we'll actually inspect the flow definition for that specific flow and check to see if there's the existence of the forward email action. And if there is, what we'll do is we'll kick off an approval to the admin who can then decide if they want to go ahead and stop that flow or not. So here's an, the opportunity to automate the governance, not just gain some visibility. This becomes a very powerful scenario when you think of having the ability to subscribe to webhooks, but then in addition to that, take advantage of our management connectors in order to perform some of those actions that would otherwise be manual events that you may not even be aware of. Um, but now you can take manual these automated actions against it and actually provide a very powerful governance experience for your organization. Another one that, that you cannot underestimate is education. When you think about a lot of organizations and how they deal with cybersecurity, probably the most important thing they do is end user education. And this is especially important when it comes to things like phishing, where you have users that may not understand that clicking on a link is bad. But once they get that education, they'll actually think twice about clicking on links when they get an email. Same thing should happen with Flow. Um, you know, if we're concerned that users might be doing something that they're not, they don't truly understand, well, I think there's an opportunity to provide some education. It's no different than giving them access to any other tools within the organization. And I think, you know, things like phishing and just end user cybersecurity hygiene. It's much in line with that. You want to provide some education so that people understand sort of what they should be doing and what they shouldn't be doing. And I think for most users, once they understand the impacts, they will generally try to follow those guidelines because uh, they don't want to see any exposure from a company perspective either. Now, a few of the things I do want to call out from an additional resources perspective is the PowerShell commandlets. So these were introduced in May. We've refreshed them recently, PowerShell version 5. Go ahead and check them out um, on this link. Talk, um, in addition, this is a, another asset that we've recently launched, and this is the Power Apps and Microsoft Flow Governance and Deployment White Paper. People have been looking for a comprehensive guide around you know, provisioning Microsoft Flow and Power Apps, and certainly understanding some of these security and governance um, recommendations. That's all within this white paper. Now, lastly, uh, we talk about the Power Platform Admin Center coming soon. Technically, I'll let the cat out of the bag a little bit here, because if you would have gone and found this yourself, um, you know, that's, that's fair as well. So we have actually launched the Power Platform in public preview. We haven't officially announced it just quite yet, but if you head over to admin.dynamics.com, uh, you'll be able to access some of these different assets. We will be talking more about this shortly, but admin analytics is another great way to get some insight into your environment and what your users are doing. So hopefully you found this beneficial. Uh, the key takeaways are that there's no silver bullet when it comes to cybersecurity, and there's certainly no silver bullet when it comes to flow and power apps, security and governance. But hopefully this gives you some insights and some strategies that you can use in your organization in order to gain the comfort that you want around using these tools as they are extremely powerful. But the flip side of that is with that power comes the opportunity to do some really impactful work for your organization by, through, the, through automation. So that's it for this week. Um, I'll be heading to Ignite here uh, shortly, and I have a few uh, upcoming videos. We'll be showing some brand new stuff. So look for that. Uh, take care, and have a great weekend. When I was young, 
I fell in love, we used to hold hands, man, that was enough yeah. Then we grew up, started to touch Used to kiss underneath the light on the back of the bush Oh no, you're done